Good morning. All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We are a webinar, webcast, online show, um, call us what you will. Um, we are here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record the show every week, so you can always go to our website and watch any of our um, archived recordings later. Um, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where all those archives are on our site. We include the recording of the show, which is posted to our YouTube channel. Um, if there are any presentations, as we have here this morning, we post that up on our SlideShare accounts. So you can have access to those if you want. Um, and any, if any important websites that we mentioned, we collect those together and post them available to you as well. Uh, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, um, book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products. Uh, basically, our only criteria is that it is something library related, um, something libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing, um, new services or products they might be interested in. Um, some of our topics might seem a little out of the box when you look at the titles, or <laughs> potentially, but trust me, everything comes around to libraries in the end. That's my only criteria that it's something library related, and all types of libraries. Um, library Commission, we are the, um, li the state library agency for uh, public, academic, special, institutional, um, museum libraries, anything across any type of library. So you'll see all sorts of things on the show. Um, both are Live show and our recordings that are available are available um, free to and available to anybody out there, free and open to anyone. So if you do know of anybody that might be interested in any of our shows, uh, friends, family, neighbors, send us them to our website, have them sign up for our upcoming shows um, or um, to watch our recordings later. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations, things that we're doing here out of the Library Commission, but we also bring in guest speakers. Um, and that's what we have this morning. Uh, to, today we are talking about UNL, University of Nebraska at Lincoln. For those of you in Nebraska, go Big Red. <laughs> For anyone else, you probably have heard of it. <laughs> um, but from the University of um, Nebraska um, Lincoln Libraries here in Nebraska, we have Michael Stratman. Hey, Michael. Morning. morning. Deb Pearson. Good morning. And Regina Flowers. Good morning, oh, Amanda. <laughs> um, and they, um, a few years ago, started making changes to their university library, which a lot of libraries have done um, around the country. And um, it was last year at the library state conference you guys did this presentation, correct? That's where I saw it, our Nebraska Library Association School Librarians Annual Conference. And I thought it was really great um, what they did with switching things around, so I invited them to come on the show today to talk about it. So I'll just hand over to you guys to take it away and tell us what y'all did. Okay, thanks, Krista. Um, first of all, thank you to the Nebraska Library Commission for inviting us. We don't usually get to go on the road with our shows. <laughs> so we got to come all at five blocks Down the out. Yes. <laughs> you, know, you take what you can get. Everybody has to start somewhere. Um, uh, so today our, our presentation is called From Collections to Commons, How UNL Turned Stacks into Student Spaces. Um, I was affiliated with this project because uh, my name again is Deb Pearson. And I'm the head of libraries facilities planning. Uh, so I had a lot of uh, fun helping plan this space. Um, so I'll turn it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Michael. And he's going to talk about a little bit about um, how we managed to start the turning stacks into student spaces. Okay, here's a picture of our finished project. We'll lead with uh, what we ended up with, the uh, Del Coriel Hall, that's a donor's name, um, in the Learning Commons. Our presentation this morning is on a transition from primarily staff-centered space uh, to user-centered space. Uh, like most academic libraries, we have a very, very large collection uh, warehousing in the middle of campus, and uh, we decided that we had an opportunity uh, to fundamentally change the space. Um, and that's the focus of today's presentation. 
So a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm the Circulation and Collections Manager uh, for the UNL Libraries. I'm responsible for the physical condition, layout, and movement of the circulating print collections. A um, little bit about me, I've done, uh, been in collections and tax maintenance uh, and management since about 1998. And between Deb and I, we have a little over five moves um, in excess of uh, 500,000 items and uh, more smaller ones than I think either of us want to count or admit to. Uh, so we've been doing this for a while um, and the processes uh, that led up to this project um, are something that we've been practicing for a long time and implementing in smaller ways throughout our systems uh, at the University of Nebraska. I wanted to start off with this particular quote um, that I found uh, from uh, Joe Hardenbrook, uh, and you can see the citation down in the corner. And as for most academic libraries, our mission is not to collect the whole of human knowledge. We have limited space, we have limited resources. We are not a warehouse for books. A warehouse is a storage facility. Books are for using, not for sitting on a shelf for years on end. Now I noticed from the uh, registration list, and those of you logging in, we have a lot of academic librarians on here. And those of you in those areas will know that this is a change uh, that's been slow in coming to academic libraries, uh, some slower than others. Um, and that's that we have been warehouses for years. We have materials uh, that we collected in the heyday um, and we all have the same 27,000 journals sitting on our shelves for years and years on end. Um, and oftentimes we've been taking up prime uh, real estate in the middle of campus just to warehouse these items. As we focus on a transition to digital collections, on to delivery of collections directly to our users and those sorts of things, the idea that those spaces in the middle of our campuses being warehouses is one that's become largely outdated and outmoded. That was the genesis for this entire project. We had a beautiful space um, and we were lucky enough, and Deb will talk a little bit more about the visioning process, but we were lucky enough uh, to have some architects and some planners that were able to see that, capture that, and convince some of our administration of that. The problem being is that that space was already being used for said warehouse and, and was, was full and had been collecting of books and desks and tables and a sort of patron <laughs> stuff for years and years on end. So uh, we were tasked with emptying it out. So the administration is, uh, approaches uh, us and looks at saying, we just need to empty one floor out of the library. All we have to do is empty this one floor. This should be pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> we even have a high density storage facility. We'll just move it, right? How hard can this be? You know, you have a limited budget, limited time. That's all things that happen in the libraries. Uh, but let's get this done. Here in this picture, you can see an example of, of what our entire floor looked like. Uh, rows and rows and rows of, of books. Um, matter of fact, uh, for many years we had ended up taking out more and more seating just to make room for more shelving uh, to bring those items in. The problem with this is that one floor was 32,000 square feet um, and had over 450,000 items on that floor. Now for those of you in Nebraska, that's almost two books for every person in Lincoln. Um, so okay, we're checking them out. And they certainly <laughs> were checking them out. So uh, we needed to figure out what we were going to do with those. And that far exceeded the space we had available um, immediately in, in our storage facilities. Another problem we had is that our collections focus for that particular floor was on the social sciences and humanities. So this was the most widely used print collection and the one that we needed to retain in the building even though that was the floor that the visionaries had identified as the one you need to move. That was a little more complicated. Our time frame was under three months, and we were not to buy any new shelving um, for any spaces or encumber any funds um, for the holding of these materials. Well, this is the point where we begin going through and, and doing our scenarios. Deb and I had a great many of these um, we, I think we wore out a whiteboard or two um, <laughs> trying to figure out what we were going to do with these. So 
uh, we thought about what if we we start with eliminating print copies of materials in JSTOR. We identify stable electronic sources, and that way these print serial runs can be moved down the road. Uh, many of you know that the print serial runs take up a tremendous amount of space, um, and uh, so our idea is, well, if we eliminate those, then maybe we won't have 450,000 we need to move. So, what if we take the science print materials off-site instead of the humanities and uh, social sciences? Our particular complex that we were talking about doing this in is comprised of two buildings, uh, Love South and Love North. Uh, one, Love South, um, consists of uh, eight floors, uh, many of them subfloors, and it was built in the 1940s. Um, and the Love North, which was built in the 1970s, which you saw pictures of, is a much more open space. So we were thinking if we pull out some of the science materials, maybe we could move the humanities and social sciences into that Love South building. Um, and then we can keep the materials that the faculty need to have in print and accessible uh, nearby and available. Another thought we had is what if we moved our government documents off-site? Our government documents at the time took up three floors, uh, those eight uh, within Love South, um, and we were looking at a way to try and bring those together with some of our branch documents collections, um, and we were really sort of out of space for those. So our thought was if we move those off-site, we would have more room again for those humanities and social sciences materials. What if we made a separate area for visual arts in the link? These two buildings, Love South and Love North, are connected by a walkway. Um, not horribly large, but very attractive. And so we were trying to think of a way of a collection uh, that, we, that we could uh, bring into that area to sort of play off of the strengths in that. So it came down to, in order to make it work, that we did all of the above. <laughs> so what this ended up being is a move that comprised 83,000 lineal feet of materials. By the time we got done touching everything, that was 1.4 million items. So we moved them through six locations, we moved 15 distinct collections. We ended up moving shelving in advance of the collections as we were emptying them. And here, <coughs> one of those things we wore our whiteboard out on. This is a sequence of how we moved the materials. Now, you'll see on the side, uh, those, those hexagons are the various areas um, and shelving locations where things go. The middle column is the proposed sequence of moves. Now each of those moves has two components. The red arrows are where we're going to move the shelving to, and the green arrows are where we move the items to. So you'll be able to see as we go along through here um, where everything ended up going. And how, this was the diagram that Deb and I used to try and keep everything straight of, of where it was at any given time. Or and where it actually worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Didn't lose anything. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> what you will see out of the end is we do have a question mark. There were yeah. even up to the very end. There was still slowing. Where's the where's that last piece going back? So. So we're going to start off talking a little bit about the kind of moves that we did in order to make this space available. Now in our link, what we used to have, um, and what we still have in a very uh, reduced footprint, is our reference collection. Uh, now those of you playing home game know that reference collections are very, very uh, limited in their use anymore. The days of ready reference has pretty, pretty much been replaced by uh, online web sources. Um, so the amount of space we needed dedicated to a print reference collection um, was deemed unnecessary. So we pulled all of this out. You can see a picture on the left of what it kind of looked like before. And on the right, we go back to putting up the shelving. Um, so we need to take 23,000 items is what we could fit in the link. Unfortunately, our visual arts collection was almost double that space. So it required us to split the collection, part of it to go into a local storage, and part of it to move upstairs. Oh, I'm going to back up one. Um, Here we go. 
We'll talk a little bit more about this, but one of the things I wanted to comment on why we chose the visual arts collection, you'll notice throughout that picture on the left-hand side, we have an abundance of natural light flowing into the building. This is one of the few spaces in our building where we actually have really nice natural light. One of the things that the visual arts faculty had requested for years was a space in which we could look at the art books in the light in which the art was intended to be done. Um, so that was our biggest focus for bringing this up here. In order to choose which of the 23 uh, were brought up top and which of the 25 were at the bottom, we primarily looked at circulation, uh, we gathered faculty input from the area, um, and we began to sort of transition into what we're now calling curated collections. Previous to this move, all of our collections were based on LC call number. If you managed to be privy to that particular system, you understood where things were. Um, and if you weren't, you were just sort of out of luck. Um, so what we're trying to do is create a curated collection that's more on subject that we advertise as such. And we'll see that a little bit more in Regina's presentation as, as we expand this idea. For the science collections, the idea was we would take 350,000 items um, from our uh, Love South building and move it into high density storage. Now, you might remember I said it didn't all fit in the high density storage, so some of it went into another facility, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Our high density facility is a high bay storage system, uh, temperature and humidity controlled. You can see the, the picture here is looking down at, at someone. Um, at the end of one of our hallways. Uh, this particular building was built about uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And it's on campus. What's that? It's on it is on <laughs> East Campus, on, okay. our, on our agricultural campus. Mm -hmm. um, and it holds approximately 950,000 items. Uh, so what we've been moving stuff into there for a long time, and as you can see from this particular picture, there's not a lot of open space. Uh, the interesting thing about these particular facilities is items are shelved by size uh, rather than call number order. So each item has a specific item location code and we dispense with call number order in order to fit more books in a smaller yeah. space. It doesn't matter, it's not going to be browsed by anybody. So. Nope, yeah. not unless you're on a forklift 35 <laughs> feet in the air. So. Now our other section was the government documents. Um, the university was lucky enough that as uh, the National Guard here in Lincoln uh, was moving facilities, several of their buildings adjacent to campus became open. Um, so we were able to take possession of this Department of Defense uh, building here that you can see. Um, and we began erecting shelves in it to turn it in. We were lucky enough that the, the state was able to provide uh, proper insulation and what have you throughout the building, um, but it, it fundamentally still is a monster. So <laughs> we put in our units, uh, government documents, Nebraska documents, UN documents, um, and OAS documents. So in looking at what we have, Love North first floor, the picture we saw before with the rows and rows of stacks, this is what it looks like when we begin taking materials off of the shelves. Love North had 456,000 inches of materials. Uh, Love South uh, had 483,000 inches of space after we get done removing all of the science materials, the government documents materials, and the other uh, random collections that were over there. At 12,153 shelves, those of you quick on your calculators know that that is 2.3 inches per shelf of spare space not very much at all and certainly not room for error. Um, so it was a quite tight move as we went in. Here's another image you can see of what the floor looked like when we were beginning to take collections off of it. The entire floor is completely packed full. And from this vantage point you can see approximately a third of the, the uh, almost half a million volumes that were on this level. So, what did we learn out of this? Um, planning, planning, and more planning. Um, and uh, as you go through things, you need to be prepared when your first plan doesn't work. 
inevitably it won't. <laughs> and I had many instances where we thought something would fit in a space and it didn't, and adjustments had to be made. The notion behind this is to be flexible in any of your move plannings. Um, those of you that do space planning, you know that uh, as it comes along, you're going to run into difficulties, um, and you need to be selling to the administrators, um, to the fundraisers, um, a vision that has room for change. It's not going to look like what you think it's going to look like as you come off the bat. Um, so make sure and be flexible. Don't be afraid to find help. Uh, this is probably the biggest thing you need to learn um, in doing these processes. Use people that have experience in this area. Uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this webinar is to talk about that. Uh, put ourselves out there, make sure you find other sources, get different ways of doing things. Um, find professional movers, specifically library movers. Um, we all know that, that library movers are a specialized breed, um, and we certainly don't want to just sort of leave it to uh, uh, the, the two U-Haul, two men in a truck, <laughs> U-Haul, a couple of guys for manpower. You need to find people that specialize in this. They will make your lives easier. Uh, and do that. The other thing to think about is what is left over. When you finish this project from a collections point of view, you'll be left with a space, but there's going to be leftover shelving, there's going to be uh, leftover detritus, there's going to be dirty floors, there's going to be all sorts of stuff. It's not just about the books. And that is where my colleague uh, <laughs> gets to shine on our own. You left me with a dirty space. <laughs> right, exactly. Whoops. Okay, right. So, um, after Michael got everything moved off, this is what he left me with. 28,000 <laughs> square feet of filth. Um, it is huge. Uh, before the pre presentation started, my colleagues and I were trying to figure out just what this was back in the day. So we, we figured it out. Um, <coughs> a little bit about how we came to have this space. Michael uh, alluded to it in his opening remarks. Uh, we had the university um, hired Sasaki, an architecture firm from Boston, to come out and re review the, the campus. <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> campus master plan, and they were just sort of wandering around the campus on a break and happened to wander into the library. And uh, you can see from the upper left-hand picture here, that, uh, and a little bit to the right, but mostly straight ahead to the left, this whole floor is primarily almost floor-to-ceiling windows, looking out on things like um, some beautiful uh, sculptures in our campus-wide sculpture garden. We had some, some great landscaping. Our landscaping people have just done a fabulous job with the campus over the years. Uh, some of the buildings on campus are quite impressive. And unless you were lucky enough to get a, a uh, carol around the, the perimeter of the, build, of the floor, you didn't see any of those things. So they quickly ascertained that this could be an academic hub for the lot for the for the campus, and we're very excited to come back to the campus planning people and uh, drag them over to Love North, which many of them admitted they hadn't been in in years, to show them what a jewel we have in the center of the campus, and with quote unquote very little effort, <laughs> <laughs> it could really be turned into something special. Um, so we fast track to the top of a very long uh, construction list. Uh, some of you in academic and probably public too know that when you want to get onto that construction list, you start at the bottom, work your way up over a number of years, fall back a couple of times when higher priority uh, projects come into play, and so on and so forth. And so in a matter of literally months, we went from not being on the list at all to being the um, one with a bullet, if you will. So thus the three months of planning that we had. But anyway, that brings us to here. We have 28,000 square feet of uh, asbestos mastic to, to pull up first. So that was kind of a, a pre-project project. So every one of these tiles had to be manually chipped off so the mastic could be uh, replaced or be removed, I'm sorry. 
And the other fun part of this project in the abatement world is we were the first uh, pr um, project in the state that came under a new government rule about uh, PCBs, which were a carcinogen used in grout back in the 70s when this was building was constructed. So we had to factor in cost and time to have a grout scraped, put into a little test tube thing, sent off to somewhere in Pennsylvania, tested, and then sent back with the results that the area was either clear of PCBs or the PCBs couldn't be removed, so they had to be encapsulated. This had to happen with every window, and you will see that there are many of them there because one part of the project was to, to remove the thin tube at the bottom there and replace it with floor to ceiling windows, put a new HVAC system in the, in the uh, above the ceiling, uh, basically replace the whole um, HVA system in the basement, which was another fun project, um, and uh, turn this into a learning commons. But it was brought in on budget and on time by working with great um, construction people, university project managers, everybody just really pulled together and did a great job. This is a, a picture of the area in process. Um, we went with an interesting kind of ceiling process. Instead of just replacing the ceiling with laid in ceiling tiles, we did kind of an industrial vibe, painted the entire uh, ceiling black, and used some ceiling tiles, but we also used some floating islands. You can see kind of in the center of the uh, picture there, there are individual strips of wood that they put into what they call islands that, that held lighting fixtures and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a very unique look uh, to the area. Um, we replaced custodial closets, telecommunications closets, the elevators were completely refurbished with new elevator closets. We put lots of card access devices in, that's the, the new thing. We built a new vestibule onto the north side, which you saw in our opening slide. We, as far as landscaping goes, to the, to the left of the picture, the landscaping was basically a bunch of berms with trees on them. And we decided to replace that with a beautiful new plaza, which again you saw on the slide at the beginning of the uh, of the presentation. So it really did extend outside the building and really encompass a major portion of the heart of the campus, as, as Michael indicated at the beginning. And we have a Duncan Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> the two things that the students of the University of Nebraska Lincoln said they wanted in a study space were for it to be open 24 7 and for it to have a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. So Thanks to the uh, a very adventurous and risk-taking franchise holder for Dunkin' Donuts, they said, "Well, sure, that sounds like a great idea. But in a coffee shop in a library, of course, who wouldn't do that?" So they did, and it is, as you can see, it has been a, a just a, an outstanding success to the point that last summer we actually agreed to giving over half of our vending area so that their preparation room could be expanded, so they could offer a wider variety of pastries and uh, uh, we can't do sandwiches and soups. We're not a full service Dunkin' Donuts, but the students seem very pleased that they can have uh, any kind of coffee drink they want, frappuccinos to their heart's content, <laughs> and lots and lots of caramel glazed donuts, which appear to be their favorite. So we were, <laughs> we were just thrilled that we could give the students the two things that they wanted. New kind of statistics to, to collect. Well, and Regina will talk about it. Don't have So as I mentioned before, we have about 28,000 square feet of, of, of space. We have about, we have control of about 75% of that. The uh, northeast, so, I'm sorry, southeast corner of the commons was given over to a new digital learning center AKA a uh, computer testing center. Uh, we consolidated all the testing centers on campus into this. It's got about 184 seats. 
It is the largest testing center in the Big Ten. We stuck a few extra seats in just to make sure that was the case. <laughs> and the students love it. It's all self-contained. The students pro, uh, make reservations for themselves online. Um, the, the instructors love it because now they don't have to give over however many testing uh, tests they want to give during the semester. They can have every teaching, every class meeting is a teaching time and not a time set aside to take a test. The students like the flexibility of being, being able to take tests when they want. It's comfortable. As you can see, if you look straight through, it's got a great view again if students need to, to you know, kind of refocus for a minute. So we're happy to have them there. It's been a great success and it brings more students into the space if they had no other reason to come but that they have a great reason to come to the space. Is that open 24-7? It's not open 24-7, but it's yeah. actually open a lot longer than the combined ones were before. Mm -hmm. And it is, they do have a lot of weekend hours, which the students right. really enjoy. These are just an example of, of the spaces. We decided to informally divide the space into three areas. Uh, one is a, a programming space and Regina will talk a little bit more about that where the, the furniture is more mobile so that we can clear it out for different kinds of presentations. Another area is more the collaborative space where we have a small 18 seat uh, computer lab. We have about nine Macs and nine PCs, lots and lots of uh, collaborative tables around and, and uh, then the third space uh, which is sort of in, in indicated there on the left is a quiet, more traditional study space. That's what the students also asked for, was really a almost throwback. Uh, you can't see from this picture, but in another picture you'll see that it's almost a throwback to the old reading rooms of the, of the last century, where lots of wooden tables and lights and comfortable chairs where the students can really just spread their materials out and do some, in, some uh, quiet study. Here's an example of that more traditional study space in the upper right-hand corner. The lower right-hand corner has, uh, we were able to incorporate a two-sided electric fireplace in the, in the space, which has just been, I don't know what would have happened if we wouldn't have been able to have that, because it really has become a gathering place for students year-round, and especially when we have the heat component of the electric uh, fireplace on, but it has really become a, a great gathering place for the students. Then on the on the uh, left hand side is an example of that uh, programming more mobile furniture area that Regina will talk again about. And you can also get a better sense of those uh, ceiling islands that I was talking about. And uh, Regina, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure. Um, I think this quote gives you an idea of kind of what we were doing and uh, what was behind this project. Again, you know, finding the value in new things, what will add value um, and be appreciated by our users. Um, before I go into detail about my section, I will turn it over to Michael to talk a little bit about our service point. Okay. Uh, one of my roles now that we've emptied the place out and turned it into something different is, is coordinating uh, the service desk component in this space and, and throughout the libraries. What you'll see here is, is what we call a shared service space. Uh, it's continually changing, continually evolving as partnerships both within and without the libraries uh, join us. Uh, you'll see here that it's divided into a section uh, with a, what we call Husker Tech. That's the uh, campus information technology folks. Um, we've been lucky enough that they partner and they put in a full service uh, uh, access point within the commons. Um, this helps greatly with the, the uh, large number of questions on how do I access the Wi-Fi, how do I register my device, I have trouble uh, printing or things like that. Um, the Husker Tech is able to share those with us. On the other side over there, you'll see a shared service point where we have both uh, individuals trained in reference services, more traditional uh, library reference point questions, as well as uh, what would be traditionally general circulation sort of questions. The, the check-in, check-out of materials, everyone has a shared understanding about uh, basic directional questions, basic reference, basic circulation, but we try to have specialists 
um, at those desks at all times um, so that we can share across departments. Um, part of the creation of this whole space led to the creation of a coordinated uh, service point group that integrates all of our partners um, and all of our service desks. And that was one of the things that really, I think, came out of the Commons uh, that's really served us well in all of our spaces is, is how do we better work with our partners to deliver our services seamlessly at any location, not just within the Commons. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Very good. Oh, boy. I hit something funny. Oh, it's okay. Um, just go down to the lower right off of this keep up and just click that. There, you go. there we go. And it can be the orange arrow at the top and it will move that out of the way. Then you can slide it over. There you go. Yep. And then just click right back in. Awesome. I'm All good. Hey. <laughs> Very good. So uh, I am Regina Flowers and I am the manager of the Dell Hall Learning Commons. Um, I kind of had to hit the ground running. I started the last business day before the commons opened, so I missed all the fun of moving <laughs> the commons and the construction. And Regina, remind us when it opened. Sure, it opened in January of 2016. Great. Uh, as this project started, one of the questions we got a lot was, what makes the Learning Commons different from the Nebraska Union? Um, on the left here, you can see one of our open study spaces in the Commons, and then on the right, uh, two pictures in the Nebraska Union. Of course, there are similarities. Uh, they're both public buildings with spaces to, for students or users to connect and collaborate. Uh, but the Nebraska Union really is the social hub on campus, and we see Love Library and the Adele Hall Learning Commons as the academic hub on campus. Um, we've mentioned some of the ways that we kind of highlight that academic focus. Uh, Deb talked about areas for quiet and collaborative study. We chose a variety of furniture that would be conducive to student study habits. Michael mentioned the shared service point with research, circulation, and technology help. Um, we also have ample technology in our spaces, a strong wireless connection uh, to accommodate students working on project or um, presentations, and then we do offer a variety of academic and focused programs as well. So not only do we try to strive to promote that academic focus, um, but since we've been open, our users have solidified our reputation as the academic hub on campus. Um, here you can see students using our space, and uh, it's quite full, and they're using it to study. So on the left, we have an image of one of our reservable study rooms, and then on the right, again, is those um, long tables that Deb was talking about in our quiet reading room. But harking back to a more traditional space. <clears throat> Before I go too far, I want to kind of give you a lay of the land of um, the Learning Commons. Down here in the bottom right corner, you can see that Digital Learning Center, as Deb talked about, that takes up about 25% of our space. Uh, and then those three quadrants that we were mentioning, we've got the Quiet Reading Room. Um, up here on the top left corner is a collaborative space. That's where our computer lab is. Um, this programming space back here behind Dunkin' Donuts, it has mobile furniture. It's used for student study space when we are not doing um, larger events. Uh, our shared service point is right in the middle of the space. Um, this small space uh, across from the service point is where we do drop-in programming and consultations. Um, and then all along this corridor, you can see our reservable study rooms. We have 11 small study rooms that will seat up to four students, and then we've got four large study rooms in the space that will hold up to 10. Great. Uh, throughout our space, we also have some small curated uh, collections that Michael had mentioned and alluded to. Um, there's a variety of collections. On the right, you can see our popular fiction. We also have popular science. We have some career books. We have a research and writing reference collection. Um, we also have two featured titles collections, and those are rotating. Uh, they rotate every semester. They're based on themes as well. Okay. Part of my position is to maintain our usage numbers. We are uh, an active space, and we're, so we're constantly collecting data, looking at that data, 
um, seeing you know how we need to you know tweak our services or what we offer in our space. So here's kind of a look at that first year and a half we've been open. Um, you can tell we are highly used. We've had more than a million people through the gates since opening. Our service point is utilized for a variety of services and questions. We've answered more than 9,000 questions, research questions. Um, we've had more than 16,000 circulation transactions and more than 6,500 technology equipment checkouts through Husker Tech. Um, our study rooms are highly utilized. Students can reserve them for up to two hours a day, and we've had more than 45,000 study room reservations. Um, one of my favorite statistics, of course, is the Dunkin' Donuts uh, numbers, and we sold more than 122,000 donuts uh, since then. So, how do you have information on how this compares to before statistics? I mean, I know some of the things you didn't have, of course, like Dunkin' Donuts and whatnot, but. Sure, sure. You know, we can compare, you know, people through the door, um, you know, those kind of numbers. We have to keep in mind, though, that. Um, we have additional services in there as well. Right. So, yeah. you know, when we look at the number of people there. through the door, um, we also have uh, the digital learning center. So, there are all the people mm -hmm. testing or all the people coming in to do stuff in donuts or um, on campus. <coughs> There's lots That's of really campus tours. Mm -hmm. um, pushes up those numbers as well. Um, the Learning Commons is an active space. It is a user-centered space. In addition to keeping track of these usage numbers, we are um, always kind of asking for feedback from students. And so we'll post whiteboard questions and see what they, what they like, uh, what changes can be made in the space as well. Um, another thing that we do to keep the space active and engaging is programming. Um, the pictures here are some of the drop-in consultation programs we do. On the left, you can see career services, another department on campus. Once a week, they come in and offer drop-in help for resume writing and job searching. Um, on, on the right, it, you can see one of our library programs. Uh, it's Demos and Donuts. It's a quick kind of 15-minute demo on library services. So here we've got Joyce Melvin, our interlibrary loan manager, and she's talking about delivery with students. And again, that's that space across from the service point. So it's right in the heart of the Learning Commons. It's a lot of traffic through there. We also host a variety of larger events. Um, on the left is Big Red Ruckus. This is a welcoming event for new students that we do in the fall. Um, we work with our building partners to highlight academic services on campus, help new students kind of get ready for their first semester on campus. Um, here we've got two students and they are competing. Um, they're uh, trying to look up resources in our catalog and see who can find materials <laughs> the fastest. Um, in the top corner is an image from Notes at Noon. It's a bi-weekly concert series we do in the fall and spring. We work with the School of Music and uh, the Music Library to coordinate faculty and student performance opportunities. And then in the bottom image is from our SciPop Talks. Now this is in that program space. That mobile furniture comes in handy because um, we can really uh, change the space to suit the needs that we have. Um, but SciPop Talks looks at the um, intersection of science and pop culture. All right, so to circle back, um, we want to kind of show you again this evolution um, in a quick two years from stacks to student space. Um, you know, today we really talked about the how, you know, how we renovated the first floor of Love North uh, to turn it into a learning commons. Uh, but what I'd like to do is in this presentation on um, the, the why and why this project is important not only to the library but to the larger university. Um, and that answer can be found in the responses we've seen from our users. Um, we've heard them say things like, the Learning Commons is my second home, um, I'm getting better grades. And I'd like to end uh, with this uh, quote that we got on one of our whiteboard questions, our prompts for a response, where the student saying, you know, I love having more space to study and work with others. With such a large student body, having lots of study space helps students study habits and improves academics greatly. And nice. that, nice. we'll open it up to questions. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, yes, anybody, if you have any questions, type them into your questions section in your GoToWebinar interface. I can see them here and grab them. Um, also, I didn't mention earlier, if you have your own microphone, you can ask your question that way. Just mm -hmm. type in, I have a microphone, please unmute me. And um, I will do that. <coughs> and you can answer it that way. Um, 
So nothing came in while you're talking, but that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the study space that you're mentioning, that, that going, you know, kind of retro or whatever, but traditional lecture tables, I think that's really very telling. So many people are saying, you know, we don't need all this, you know, it's all online, it's all tech technology, it just as a device. And that's not the reality. The students, just like when we were in college, need, I need a place to spread out with all my stuff and my papers and my books that I still am using, yes. And I'm glad that you got that information from them saying what they wanted and not just assuming, you know, what would be something that would be, um, let's see, we do have, well, someone, Allison here says she toured the space last year, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you, Allison. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so we do have questions coming in here. Um, is there anything you added that doesn't get used or that you were surprised by? So is there anything that was, hmm. you know, there's always, you know, things could be changed or don't, don't, don't be afraid to fail, but is there anything that was not, not as expected? Well, we have okay. seen a few things in terms of usage uh, that we've been changing in services, less than physical plant, but yeah. more of the services. Um, one of those is 24-7 mm -hmm. um, that had a very strong, you know, we really want this space to be open. We want it to be open. Well, whoever said that didn't show up. Um, <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> we were looking at in the statistics on, you know, on an average overnight use, uh, you might have three or four people. Oh, um, so uh, honestly, in, in, in our current budget environment, that's difficult to sustain. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are looking now, uh, we've reduced for the summer hours uh, to try and experiment a little bit with what does, what does not having a 24-7 space look like, uh, just because we, we, we waited a year to see how it was completely used. Sure. And, you have time uh, to figure out how to use it. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's been a year of full use, so we've been a year and a half of being open, so we wanted to have a full uh, academic year uh, to be able to examine it. So we're looking at least over the summer hours of how those hours function reduced with the combined service points. We've also had some changes in the nature of questions being asked at the various service points. Um, so is it the best use of a, for instance, of a reference librarian's time to be stationed at that space, or do we need to provide better reference training for our student workers uh, that work in that space or to, to paraprofessionals that work in that space uh, to be able to answer the same level of questions without necessarily um, using a reference library in those areas. So I think most of our changes have been service based uh, rather than facilities and layout based. Mm -hmm. I think the one sense. facility uh, change we made was adding some additional door openers to some of our mm -hmm. study rooms. Um, our space is ADA compliant, uh, but uh, whatever we can do to make it a little more welcoming mm -hmm. and accommodating, mm -hmm. so we did have those as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, here we go. How many of these space ideas came from your staff versus external architects or designers? I was wondering about that too when you were talking when Debbie, you were talking about the ceiling and how we chose the the wooden <coughs> island type lighting and whatnot. Um, That's a great question. The the basic design came from the architects. Um, there was a a planning group made up of library faculty and staff that helped the architects understand that we certainly wanted a lovely architectural space, but it needed to perform well as a library, primarily as a learning home. So yeah. we wanted it pretty, but we did want it usable as well. So um, we had some conversations about uh, things that they wanted to use for surfaces on floors and things like that. But it was it was primarily the the what the architects envision, I would say, is 90% of what we got. Mm -hmm. Looking back, knowing the success of the Dunkin' Donuts thing, it would have been nice if that could have been larger, but you know, that there's the trade-off of how many student seats do you take up for more donuts. So, <laughs> you know, we, we, we took a, a gamble on that, and uh, we're pretty successful. Um, I think in most, many libraries who have done coffee shops, I can't there are usually very successful ones, yeah as long as you yeah know what you're doing with them and, yeah and we're lucky it's that uh, it basically is I mean it's not really it's a library partner but we are not responsible for staffing or anything they're all yeah, yeah. Okay. Regina has a very good 
working relationship with the manager and, and we have a positive working relationship with the franchise holders. So we get together a couple times a year. Just to, we just recently reviewed the summer or the fall hours for the for the shop over our semester break. And so we have a very cordial and positive working relationship from with everybody from that area. What I'll also add is we have the advantage that the Nebraska Union had gone through a renovation shortly before we started our project. Um, and so I know that our group got the opportunity to kind of go in there and observe the use of that space and kind of, you know, take some some things back with us. One the uh, the union, you know, they serve a larger audience. They should have, um, you know, larger seating areas and larger booths. But I know one thing that we noticed was, you know, one person sits at a booth meant for eight, and you lose those seven right. seats. Um, so those kind of factors played into some of the furniture choices uh, that we made. And I know we brought in samples too and did yeah. uh, sit tests and got feedback from students on the type of furniture. And one of the things. Um, that we learned that's reflected, I think, in the quiet reading room in particular, is that students wanted uh, serious furniture for the serious work that they are doing on campus and weren't as drawn to, you know, really bright, flashy uh, colors or intricate designs. That's not important. They're not thinking about that's not important. They're going to do it. They want the paper paper to do yeah. the research. Yeah. Because yeah. they'll be there for several hours at a time, so they want things that are comfortable and they want furniture that if, if they're meeting with one group they need kind of a study room situation and another group might need more collaborative furniture that they can pull together to make a bigger uh, group so they want to be able to do all that in the same space and go get a cup of coffee while they're at it so um, yeah, yeah, I, I really think that the user input comes at the very beginning in, in the in the broadest notions of what they're looking for in space, which is, you know, so we certainly started with that with a request for Dawn's request for 24 7, a request for traditional as well as more technology. Then we take over in the middle and, and try and make some of those decisions and some of the structural um, builds on those ideas. And then we come back to the user on some of the small details, like, okay, this is a space we're building. You like this chair or this chair? You know, so <laughs> yeah. we really kind of uh, uh, do a sandwich way of, of, of using the users. Um, we certainly didn't have time as fast tracked as this process was yeah. uh, to be able to have user input on the entire project. Um, so I think that's why we kind of chose the sandwich method in, in order to pull it off. And we had been redoing several areas in the older building in Love South over the past few years, experimenting with color, experimenting with different types of furniture. We used one of our uh, big reading rooms on the second floor. We converted it from our, my, our media services area to a, a student seating area that had met with a great deal of success. So we were able to pull some of the uh, designs that we used in that area, modify them a little bit, and move them over into um, yeah, so we sort of had a lab over in Love South for mm -hmm. a number of years. That's something that I was wondering about is that during this time of when, well, everything was in turmoil, moving the books and nothing, empty space and construction about how, what any kind of effect it had on the students trying to use the library. But I would think having them involved in the decision making would help with some of the Issues about why can't I get what I need to, or where am I supposed to go now? It, it did certainly cause us to focus on yeah. a more robust delivery system. Uh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. We modified the facility in some ways to be able to access other areas. Uh, it used to be you could only get to the basement through that floor when that floor was under construction. We had to come up with other ways to access those collections. So we did try and keep those users in mind, and, and we expanded a lot of services and spaces. Outside of this specific floor uh, during that time to try and be close. Yeah, that's something that we can't and we also close things down for right. <laughs> and we also try to keep everybody apprised of the progress uh, mm -hmm. on our website. We posted pictures as often as we could mm -hmm. and kind of gave construction updates at staff meetings and uh, mm -hmm. tried to ha help everybody be in the loop. So if they were off campus at High B. And somebody said, so what's going on over at the library? Everybody would be able to give, you know, that elevator talk that we all that we all know about to kind of keep the citizens of the state and, and kind of going too, because they could have been anywhere and if their their daughter or son was home from school and said, Oh geez, there's really a lot going on at the library and they run into a colleague somewhere, they would be able to say, So what is going on at the library? And, and that person would be able to give a little more information.
and keep that whole thing going on. Yeah. Well, I also think that's one of the importance of moving collections very, very quickly. I mean, we joke that they only gave us three months, but we certainly wouldn't want much longer. Yeah. Uh, people that need to know where their materials are. Um, so being able to move them very, very quickly, um, as opposed to drawing that process out, maybe as long as we would like to, would have actually <laughs> had a, <laughs> an adverse impact. Sure, yeah. um, there's a few other questions here. Um, during the 24 7 time that it's open, do you have staff on hand throughout all night long? How does that work? We did. Well, we had. Uh, at Rice with the university, we had 24 7 hours um, during finals time. Mm -hmm. And we did not have librarians or staff on hand. We had security mm -hmm. right. just to keep the building available for them. We don't have permanent staff. We have student workers, and one of our community partners. Um, in the space is UNLPD, our, our police department. So we had a community service officer, security, um, along with those. But we do have two uh, students trained um, in both basic reference and in access on site at all times. Cool. So in addition to the, the CSO that would stay overnight in the building when it was open 24-7, one of the things that we had worked with UNLPD with over the years, and they had come to us a couple or three times and said, you know, we're really interested in having a satellite office in the center, more in the center of campus. And every time we hear of a building being renovated, we visit with them about that possibility. And they say, oh, you know, I think we could build you something down in the east corner of the basement. <laughs> and they say, well, no, we really want to be up where the students are. So administration, I, I took that to administration and the decision was made to, I think if you remember on the map, one of the uh, small study rooms we converted into a satellite office for uh, university police. And we've had a couple instances where students have remembered that there was a uh, UNLPD presence in the building and, and come back to the commons from wherever they were um, to consult with a uh, university police mm -hmm. officer. So that so they finally got us. They needed really. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, they got a spot the center the best, campus, yeah. and, and they, they can, wanted. To, they don't want to be. <coughs> they want to be available to the students. Absolutely. So, so that was a relationship. With yes. Them. So so we were able to accommodate that request on their part, and um, it's. I think it's worked out pretty well. Well, their visibility is such. We've had students walk to the Commons police space when uh, they were actually near to the police station. Really? <laughs> yeah, to begin with. So, uh, but, but they had saw it and, and remembered that it was there. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have another question about the gate counts, that it looks like about a quarter of your gate counts is for donuts and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> does, how does that compare to previous usage without the food? Um, or is that even... Well, it's really hard to compare what the, the gate, what drives the gate count. Uh, certainly, we do know that, that a quarter of the people come in and they do buy a donut. You know, why if they're there for the donut or they're there for something else? Um, previously, the way the floor was laid out, we did have a, a circulation point at an exit, but since there wasn't much on that floor other than the right. amenities tax, there really wasn't a reason the traffic was there other than looking for a convenient way out. Um, um, on, on sort of a anecdotal note, I would say that a, a large number of that coffee and donuts is consumed by library staff, so they're not <laughs> <laughs> all That's necessarily true. people yeah. coming into the door. Um, <laughs> and we just we we see a lot more of everybody in the building. I mean, a lot more non-library faculty come over and find reasons to say, "Well, let's just walk over to the to the commons." A, because it's a beautiful spot. I mean, it really is a, a lovely area. It's got a great view uh, all the way around it, and it's got comfortable places to sit both inside and outside. And, you know, they we keep talking about Dunkin' Donuts kind of facetiously, but it is a, a driver. It does pull people in, but not everybody comes over to, to get a coffee and a donut. It, it is just a beautiful, comfortable place to be. And people that didn't really have a reason to come to the library before are now finding reasons to come in, which we're tickled about because we can share with them what other services we have available. And Husker Tech is right there, so they may not have realized that that was something that we could offer. So, well, and as a corollary, we see use throughout the building yes, uh, increase by changing that yeah. form. So our 
our, our use of services in, in other spots or study areas uh, that used to, in, in the other building that might have been sparsely populated before are now full. So the entire building really gets more used by bringing people in through that. It's really place. such a change you really can't compare yeah. to what it was before you right. we are prepared. I, During busy times of the semester, I will be wandering through the building with my little Ask Us button on. And I will have students come up and say, we can't find any place to sit. <laughs> and I'll say, did you check here? Yeah. Did you check here? Yeah. Well, let's go check. Oh, no, that's full. So I, I worked at the library for 30 years, and I never remember so, having students coming up and tell me that they need help finding some place to sit. I mean, that's that was just unheard of. So that's the biggest change that, that personally I can see is that we are full. Yeah. And the Commons added 500 seats to 700 that were already in the library. So it, it's a lot to yeah. have people all, that. all of our yeah. senses. Yes. Um, you were talking about um, using the rest of the library, and actually some of the other questions sort of related to that. When the, and I know you're working on going away from this, but people are very curious about when you were open 24 7. Were, um, do people have access to other library areas or just the Commons? Just the Commons. Oh. So we have a security gate that closes that area. Um, with the limited staffing, we really didn't yeah. feel, uh, and the limited use, uh, we really didn't feel that, that we could afford to staff the entire complex um, and keep it in a, in a safe, secure manner. And now you've learned that it probably isn't as needed as the time. Do you guys do the um, 24 hours? Do you guys also do that during the um, uh, final time? Extended hours, anyways? Well, see, so we, we, have, we do have extended hours for the rest of the physical collections that aren't in the commons, uh, but they are not 24 7 through the entire building. It is extended during mm -hmm. the time. And after the the South Complex closes. The, the Commons is only uh, available to people that are affiliated with the university. Sure. It's mm -hmm. like hard access at oh. that point. So, um, so that's that, that yeah. Way too. Mm -hmm. Not just anybody coming in yeah. in the middle of the night to hang out. Or, yeah. <laughs> and when we look at the summer hours, um, we are open seven days a week in the summer from 7.30 a.m. to 2 a.m. Um, so we're really yes. talking about so, a small yeah. uh, yeah. so, a lot of time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, and Elsa wants to know more about your um, your high density storage. Mm -hmm. um, some more information about that. Um, do how do your students request many materials from there? How does that work for? If we selected correctly, they don't, right? <laughs> um, so the, we, we try to put materials out there that we need to maintain to to uh, uh, and preserve to use as a you know as an academic library part of our. Our mission is the storage materials. Um, so, uh, but we do get a fair amount of requests. We deliver between uh, the eight locations of which the, the high density facility is one, and we have any material from any library can be delivered to you within 24 hours. Um, so, um, and then that's on, a, of course, a business uh, week. Um, so, um, we do get a fair amount of requests from there. A lot of it's in their library loan, uh, research materials that we put there, in which case they're scanned and sent directly. So those are available for other Everything is available, so it's a complete deal. We do have a large number of special collections and archives around there because it is our best uh, preservation environment in terms of temperature and humidity. Right. Yeah. What's that? Like the new Yep, we, we have just initially uh, added a second module to our high density storage facility, uh, which should come on any day now uh, <laughs> as we anxiously check our email every morning. So, uh, but, uh, and that's an expansion specifically for special collections and archives. And our hope is eventually, as we're able to move things around in the building, that we're able to free up more spaces in the, the love complex as, as we move special collections out that we can maybe return some of those spaces to play for other uses. More uh, seats. <laughs> more seats, more offices, more everything. So I think it's good to have that the climate control area for so many of those historical right. mm -hmm. just and the, the new facility or the, the added on facility uh, before it was uh, not a public building. But we have added a, a reading room, so that we'll have hours, uh, limited hours at first. Mm -hmm. But there will be open hours where researchers can come out, and we will collect materials for them and bring them out to the reading room, and they can peruse the special collections or the regular collections, either one. So uh, we'll be treating it more like a, a branch rather than a, a closed to the public. But building. the materials we put out there, we try to put out that that has uh, specific historical or. Mm -hmm collection-based needs 
All right. That is all the questions we had so far. It's a little after 11 o'clock. That's okay. We go as long as needed with people's questions and you guys need to share everything. Um, but I think since it is a little after, we'll wrap it up. If you have any urgent last minute questions, get them right now. Or, you know, you know where to find them over at UNL too. <laughs> Reach out to them there with any questions that we have. Um, so I think this was great. Yeah, like I said, I attended a session at, at the conference, which was last year though, so it's been a while since then. So it was good to hear what, how, what has happened since then. I wanted to get a bit of an update on how things are going. And I think it's, it's awesome, yeah. I need to go and take a little walk through myself. Absolutely. Yeah, and see what it's all looking like now. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Doesn't look like anything desperate is coming out right now, so I think we will wrap up for today. Uh, I'm slide the mouse down here as long as Absolutely. Do that. All right. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, the show has been recorded and will be available on our website, which I will show you right now. Um, this is our Library Commission website where you can get to our um, Encompass Live through, show through our education uh, flyout menu, Encompass Live Webcast. Or you can also just Google us. But so far in the internet world, Encompass Live is the only thing that's called that. So oh, good. Google mm -hmm. us, it's all that comes up. <laughs> um, this is our main page. Uh, we've got our upcoming shows listed, but our archives, as I showed you, are, are right here, right beneath our upcoming shows. This is where we list all of them here, and the one for today will be here uh, probably later this afternoon if, I, if, if everything uh, cooperates with me. i got to download from here, upload it to YouTube, edit and whatnot. Um, everyone who attended and um, who registered will be notified of when the recording is available. We still know this is the one from last week. It's the link to the recording, a link to the presentation. If you have putting slides out somewhere. And then um, I already have from here a link to the um, website for the library. So that will be available there. Um, our archives here actually go back to the very beginning of the show. We started Encompass Live in January 2009, and all of our recordings are also out there. Um, so feel free to go back, um, share with anyone any topics you think might be of interest to anybody. Um, yes, some of the information will be um, outdated now, but we are librarians, so we save things and archive it, and um, not a lot of space needed for this. It's just, you know, um, on, on hard drives here and on YouTube, so um, please do take a look through there and watch anything you want to. Um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is Finding Your Focus, Tips for Early Career Success. Um, Andrew Cano, who's also from here, I'm great. <laughs> um, he did this session um, at a, at a this presentation of meeting earlier this year, um, and it was really good um, session. I thought about what to do when you're just getting started in your career in library. So he's got some good tips and tricks on that, um, of getting involved in um, librarianship. So I definitely sign up for that. And there are other shows coming up. Um, we just started adding in our August dates. I've got some other um, topics on firming up and finalizing and so on. So we'll see things added to the list here as um, we get to them. So keep checking back there. Um, and Compass Live is also on Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, please do um, pop over there and give us a like. And um, don't want to log in right now. Uh, I post on here reminders. Here's a reminder about today's show, letting people know they can log down on the fly. The recordings are available. I post on here. So um, if you are um, involved in Facebook, like us there, and you'll get notified of what's going on with our show. Other than that, that wraps it up for today. Thank you much, very much for attending. Thank you very much for being here. This is great. Um, I'll have a good trip back <laughs> to your library <laughs> industry. <laughs> Honestly, I hope it's not raining. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Awesome.